Hi, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Microbiome Informatics webinar series. I'm Matt Sullivan. I'm speaking to you from Ohio State, and, and we have a number of panelists with us who are going to help with the background Q&A today. Uh, if you have a question during the talk, you'll uh, put it in the Q&A, and, and they'll be trying to real-time answer questions. And if, and if there's any that come up a few times or seem really important, they may try to interrupt the speaker. Uh, today, I'm the speaker, and I've, I've put a picture here that I've grabbed off the web. It's a pretty beautiful picture of a community of microbes living together. This is a microbiome, and, and I just want to admit right out of the gate, I, I, I feel a bit like an imposter. I really study viruses that infect these microbiomes, but I'll try to convince you that, that maybe we've got a pretty neat webinar series put together here. Um, I've been very fortunate to work with a number of great folks through the years, and I think they've got some nice lectures put together for the next coming uh, set of Tuesdays here in March and through May. So given my imposter syndrome about really not being a microbiome scientist, I'll just start from how did we actually get here to trying to put together a hands-on microbiome informatics webinar course. And, and I, I felt this was valuable just because I think it's all important for us to know when you're studying microbiome science, you probably don't feel too comfortable about the whole package because it's a pretty interdisciplinary effort. I was trained in my, my PhD at MIT with Penny Chisholm, where we were studying really early ecogenomics, ecology and evolution of Prochlorococcus, the most abundant photosynthetic cell. She discovered this organism along with Rob Olson using flow cytometry, just a new tool to measure things in the oceans. And when I was there for about a decade, uh, it, it was an incredibly exciting time. Now that I look back for microbiome science, we, we didn't actually yet call it microbiome science. So I put some more pictures up here. This is Martin Poltz, who was pioneering uh, population genetics in Vibrio. Uh, Ed DeLong, who helped bring in and, and popularize a lot of the methods related to metagenomics and has, led, has uh, discovered a lot of uh, amazing finds. The one that jumps into my mind is a sort of perennial adoption story that he and Oded Beja made as a classic discovery from metagenomics. Roman Stocker, who's a very innovative, really physicist and, and mathematician and, and came at questions from a very small scale, microfluidics, and he was interested in how microbes interact and study them at the single cell, many interactions at a time. And then Eric Ohm, who at the time was just beginning to start to take this microbiome thinking that was coalescing at MIT and other places during this time from soils in a big complex project called Enigma that was de-refunded into the human. And so he was doing some early human microbiome work. So, so my formative years as a PhD student and postdoc were spent in this really incredible training ground to think about microbiomes. I then became faculty in 2008 and, and after getting my program off the ground in 2010, Howard Ackman uh, approached me about teaching a, a, a hands-on problem in genomics course as part of an NSF funded IGER program at the University of Arizona. And I taught that for a few years and that's where I began to really try to get into how do we apply what would today be called microbiome level questions. How do we answer these kinds of questions? And at that time, really from 98 to 2012, I'd say we were, a lot of the field was shifting from using 16S based sequencing approaches to metagenomics, where you're trying to get beyond who's there and ask questions about what are they doing? What are the interactions? And when I came to Ohio State in, in 2015, um, I wanted to carry on that idea. And so I started teaching a hands-on microbiome informatics class. But the truth is, uh, again, full disclosure with imposter syndrome in mind, um, I really didn't feel like I could do it alone. And so I talked to two computational scientists on campus who actually do the hands-on work at this point, because I was really at the conceptual guidance stage. And they kindly, Ben Boldick and Sharif Dubdow, uh, kindly uh, were willing to teach the course with me. And we've had a lot of fun uh, in the years since trying to, trying to get that course off the ground and polished. And the, the idea of both the problems in genomics course and the microbiome informatics course were to really take sequence data and turn that into biological explorations that could be put into papers. This stage of the work at Ohio State was really when we were moving as a field from what I'll call gene ecology, studying genes at a time and their patterns, towards genome-resolved metagenomics. So a very 
exciting time at every one of these training steps for me along the way. So this slot for the coming Tuesdays will probably be an hour and a half to two hours. And this slot will be in the future Tuesdays, really hands-on. Today, we're just getting an overview. We're trying to get a sense of place. Um, as I just alluded to, I'm no longer the hands-on person. And so I wanna focus my talk today and I won't go for two hours. It'll be about 45 minutes. And then I'll stay on for questions. I wanna focus the talk on sort of really high level why microbiome science. I think most of you are probably here with that uh, understanding already. And then shift to sort of what's this webinar series about? What are you really gonna get if you show up every Tuesday? And then I wanna end with, um, in particular for folks who are interested in, in how this science works, Ohio State, and, and what are the pieces that came together that, that led to Ohio State really presenting a microbiome informatics webinar series? So why microbiome science? Uh, I think we hear about the human microbiome a lot. It's really critical for our human functioning. We hear about the gut microbiota. They play all kinds of roles, things that are obvious related to uh, the kinds of foods we might crave impacting whether we're obese or lean. They're also less obvious impacting different kinds of cancers we're seeing time and again. The microbiome also plays all kinds of roles uh, with respect to complex diseases like autism, for example. And in those complex diseases, which for a long time maybe don't map well to the human genome and variants in the human genome, probably we're going to learn map well to the kinds of microbiota that are there and how those interactions between the microbiota and the human genome uh, start to play out. It's an exciting science. A few years ago, we started to get at strain level variation in the, the microbiome, uh, using that strain level variation to look at how microbiota may actually impact uh, drug effectiveness. And this has become really so commonplace that it's in the popular science literature as your inner ecosystem. So we, as humans, <clears throat> are living with microbiota. And so this is probably not news to any of you, uh, but I wanna just take a step back and say, you know, before the human microbiome and even this word microbiome was put out there, microbiologists were studying uh, microbes in soils and microbes that affect, in, affected plants because of biogeochemical roles, improving agriculture outputs, minimizing pathogenicity on plants. They also were studying microbes in the oceans, and some of you may know this, but half the oxygen that you breathe comes from microbes in the oceans. And as I mentioned earlier, microbes are cool, but so are their viruses. And so my lab's focused on, on viruses, so I'm just going to give my lab and my kind of science maybe two slides. I'll try not to torture you all with too much viruses, but in the seawater, we thought viruses were not actually that important for many years. And, and uh, in, in the late 80s, researchers went out, uh, Jed Furman and, and Berg and others went out and started to concentrate seawater onto, uh, at that time, an electromicroscopy grid and later uh, a filter like this one that's being used for a, a fluorescent DNA stain. And the big cells, the, the big dots there are cells and the little dots are viruses. And, and hopefully you can see there's a lot more viruses than cells. And when people started to add these numbers up and measure viral abundances everywhere, we learned if you swallow a mouthful of seawater, you've just swallowed 50 million viruses. And don't worry, they don't infect you. They don't even infect those microbes in you. They are really infecting marine microbes and they're an important part of the marine ecosystem. In fact, when people did experiments, tracer experiments, <clears throat> bottle incubation experiments, they learned that about one in three cells were killed per day. Most of the viruses we couldn't culture. And from very few measurements, viruses move through that process called transduction. They move genes from one cell to another at a massive scale. 10 to the 29th genes moved per day. And then when we think of toxins, microbial toxins, like bordetella toxin, cholera toxin, pertussis toxin, shiga toxin, actually, these are all encoded a toxin gene encoded in a viral genome in a prophage that's integrated into those microbial genomes. So viruses play really important roles in the oceans and, and it's been very hard to assess the ecosystem impacts through the years. So uh, experiments have done it. And, and I think one of the challenges is counting dots, it's difficult to translate that into eco ecological level variation. And so over the last decade or so, the field has been able to develop 
quite a bit of capabilities for studying viruses in the oceans. And that's created a, an informatic workflow that's generalizable. So in particular, for double-stranded DNA viruses, there's a quantitative sampling approach. And, and we've now already gotten single-stranded DNA viruses into this quantitative sampling approach, as well as um, starting to work on RNA viruses. And from that quantitative sampling, ecologically, we've learned viruses steal host genes. We call these auxiliary metabolic genes once they're in the virus. These auxiliary metabolic genes, or AMGs, can be really critical. For example, viruses that infected the cyanobacteria that I studied in my PhD thesis actually encode the core photosynthesis genes. These genes split water to make hydrogen and oxygen. They have been four Nobel Prizes, one studying them. This is the critical element of photosynthesis, and viruses have stolen it. And they've stolen it to make more viruses. It gives them a fitness advantage. Now, it's not just photosynthesis that viruses are manipulating. From viromic studies, we expanded that culture-based understanding to, to learn that viruses also steal central carbon metabolism genes, sulfur cycling genes, nitrogen cycling genes, the ability to use phosphorus. Viruses are manipulating a lot of really interesting pathways in microbial uh, metabolisms and, and communities. Now, a lot of these studies, when we started using sequence-based approaches, had the problem that everything we discovered was new. And so we had to actually develop uh, an analytic that could handle the new sequence space when the typical approaches couldn't. And so this required something called gene sharing network analytics. That's part of a tool, Recontact2, which you'll learn about in one of the later weeks if you are interested in the series. So this genome-based taxonomy allowed us to organize viral sequence space create a global catalog to be able to just do simple fundamental ecological studies, evolutionary studies. An example of an ecological study would look at patterns and drivers. So this is a classic latitudinal diversity gradient from the South Pole to the North Pole to look at both macro diversity and micro diversity. So variation between species and within species. And you can uh, then try to assess what are the drivers of that community structure that's emergent from your data sets. And a group called Tara Oceans also sampled, in addition to viruses globally around the world, the Tara Ocean Consortium also sampled carbon flux. They measured carbon flux. And they sampled prokaryotic and eukaryotic abundances, and then developed the genes to ecosystems analytic, combining mean machine learning and ecosystems modeling, and made predictions about which organisms drive carbon flux. And you should actually care about ocean carbon flux, even if you don't study the oceans, because Half of the oxygen you breathe comes from the oceans, and half of the carbon dioxide we as humans put into the atmosphere goes into the oceans. So the oceans currently are a giant buffer against climate change for us. And interestingly, and quite surprisingly, viruses best drove that carbon flux, and in fact, could predict greater than 80% of the variation in carbon flux observed throughout the global oceans. So, I hope this will get you excited about viruses. If you want to do any of this, um, Ben Bolick has developed, along with uh, Bonnie Hurwitz and Simon Rue and Jerome Guo and a number of others, uh, a, a new platform called iVirus that has been in, in, uh, available for the last couple of years on the cyber, cyber infrastructure that allows you to analyt analytically go through all these different kinds of virus analysis. So hopefully, while you came to us, excited about microbiomes, maybe you'll also think, oh, viruses are interesting too. Uh, so what is this webinar series that's coming? Again, I'm, I'm a little bit different than the other talks because I'm not hands-on today. This is high level and conceptual, but what is really coming? This, this is what's coming. This is an overview of, of what we think of as the microbiome workflow uh, for, for studying microbiomes and virums. And you're going to have pieces and parts from each of the individuals pictured here on Tuesdays from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time between March 2nd and May 4th. And so I'm going to go through, because of course you can't see all these, through each of these individually. So today I'm giving the overview of, of sort of why microbiome science, what, the, what this seminar series is about, webinar series, and, uh, and a little bit about why OSU is, is at, at the forefront here to present some. Then Dr. Sharif Dabdaub is going to present uh, kind of an overview on just generalized for how to use high performance computing, and then on ecological statistics and some of the current tools available
to apply those. Dr. Ahmed Zayed is going to be presenting on the more advanced ecological statistics. I mentioned that machine learning and ecosystem modeling to make predictions about which organisms were the most predictive of ocean carbon flux. You'll learn how that complicated set of analytics works through uh, Dr. Zayed's presentation. Dylan Cronin, Cronin is, who led one of our working groups at Ohio State, is going to be uh, presenting on the, the sort of fundamental upfront workflow, quality control, assembly, uh, and then binning, and ecological abundance estimates. Doctors Michaela Morton and, and Dr. Mike Schaefer are going to present on a new tool they developed uh, in Kelly Wrighton's lab called DRAM, which is meant to scalably help us functionally annotate and do it in a, in a metabolic pathways context, trying to think about how do I tell the functional stories that come out of these exciting metagenome assembled genomes from our different ecosystems we might look at. Dr. Donovan Parks is going to present uh, on his efforts to pioneer uh, getting us beyond 16S based taxonomy. And there's some beautiful work that he's done with uh, Phil Hugenholtz at the Australian Center of Ecogenomics, where they've developed a genome taxonomy database and it uses genome based uh, phylogenomics to be able to assess what microbial diversity looks like. And there's some beautiful work in the last couple of years from, from Donovan. Dr. Ben Boldick will present on uh, viral identification, annotation, and remapping. So the, the viromics, we'll call it phase one and phase two, sort of the pipeline. So this is uh, his efforts to build out virome-based tools at, at KBase and cyber, cyber infrastructures, and, and as well uh, the efforts from the Joint Genome Institute and the IMG MVR. And then at the end, we'll wrap up with uh, some new work from Dr. Olivier Zablocki, who's going to tell us about his efforts to really try to help us get at low input low biomass samples using hybrid short and long read assembly approaches. So pushing nanopore along with luminous sequencing to try to get at uh, the most, uh, the, the, the best capturing of particular microdiverse populations and hypervariable genomic islands. And his work's quite beautifully demonstrated that um, uh, in collaboration with Ben Temperton. The tool is called VRIN2, or this approach in workflow is called VRIN and VRIN2 but it's actually applicable to any low biomass sample. So that's an overview of what we expect the course to look like, the kinds of things you'll be learning. Uh, we're expecting to do next year a, a phase two effort uh, that'll focus on bringing bring in multi-omics and uh, modeling efforts that we're not covering yet in this year's webinar series. And then I've worked hard to try to reach out to different leaders in the microbiome space to understand what else is happening out there. So I, I just want to be um, uh, cognizant here. We're, we're really trying to complement existing efforts here from Cybers, KBase, and, and IMGM that do a lot of workshops on their cyber infrastructures and their systems. So they do good training in the field. And then uh, uh, Marin, who developed population genetic approaches and metagenomic approaches through his Anvio platform, and uh, Greg Caparazzo for Chime2, both have done a lot of training in their specific niches, and uh, we're trying to complement that and in, in inclusive, actually, of, of some parts of those elements where we can throughout the webinar series. I also want to just highlight, since I'm presuming there's a lot of microbiome interest out there, two webinar series coming up that are more on the science front. The first is from this Microbiome Center's Consortium. And if you just Google that, you'll be able to find links to this, but they're going to have a webinar series starting, uh, looks like next week on Thursdays from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that's going to run May 11th or March 11th through May 20th. And uh, the Joint Genome Institute's running the Viral Ecogenomics and Applications or VEGA seminar series, which is virus focused. And that's also on Thursdays. It's actually got a morning and a late evening slight slot Pacific Standard Time. And that's to be able to try to have some slots that work for Australia and some slots that work for Europe. And <laughs> so they don't have a consistent time, uh, but you can go there to find out their time slots. So that's exciting. Um, there's probably other efforts I, I haven't caught in my uh, studying to get ready for today. If you know of any, please put them in the chat. 
reach out to me personally by email. I'd love to hear about other efforts that we should be trying to communicate through this webinar series. Uh, we're very happy to help make connections and um, help this be a community effort for all of us in, in training in, in microbiome sciences. So why is it that we're doing this and you know, why Ohio State? And, and I just, there's sort of two things I'll emphasize. The first is I came to Ohio State in 2015, but I, I've been excited to learn about just how long a history of microbiome science there's been at Ohio State. And then, and then the second thing I think Ohio State's done really well is supporting interdisciplinary research. And, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share those two flavors in this, this story. <clears throat> So I'm going to start in 1997. I could have started earlier, but I think of, uh, you know, Carl Wos's work for a couple of decades and, and Norm, po Norm Pace as well, coming in together. And the, the, the vision was that using ribosomal RNA, they both were RNA biologists, and they understood RNA biology quite well. And, but when they started to look at these sequences and, and then use phylogeny, they realized that, wow, there's as much diversity in the bacteria and the archaea as there are in eukaryotes. And so this totally reframed how we view the tree of life. And what's exciting, I think in 97 is, is, you know, Norm Pace started to really emphasize the value of, in that time it was 16S ribosomal RNA, as a, a PCR-based marker that you could go out and screen microbial diversity. And just how much of microbial diversity was unknown when we use culture-based methods. And, and so this is, this is a, I think, a seminal moment. There, there are others that could have pointed to, but I also like this because when I looked at sort of the history of genome sequencing, um, I think it might've been the third genome sequence was done at Ohio State by John Reeve led this group and, and Chuck Daniels was involved in this work as well. George Church was involved in this group, though not from Ohio State. And, <clears throat> and that genome sequence was really informative for some of the early work thinking about horizontal gene transfer and how the archaea are different from the bacteria, et cetera. At the same time, um, around that time, there's a lot of RNA biology knowledge starting at Ohio State. Now, I'll, I'll just highlight Tina Hankin's uh, uh, arrival to Ohio State. She discovered uh, riboswitches, and um, it arguably was the beginning of sort of the RNA world theory and thinking about how early life could have really evolved from an RNA molecule. That's because riboswitches sort of changed our perspective from RNA being simply a step between DNA and proteins to actually having a regulatory role. And so RNA molecules as regulatory was a really big change and that led to ribozymes and people thinking then about an RNA world hypothesis. And, and the other picture there is Juan Alfonso, who uh, actually his committee member was Norm Pace. And, and Juan has been, um, he's now the director of the RNA Center at Ohio State and has been a longtime supporter of microbial communities thinking uh, and, and thinking about microbiology in ecosystem context. I think really key elements as a foundation for microbiome science to flourish. And the funding agencies started to recognize this early on as well. They, they funded a microbial physiology and diversity summer course that Bob Tabita and others in the Department of Microbiology at Ohio State had led. And, and that, I think, became a, a nice start for this historic timeline I'll present here. So uh, I mentioned already this summer course and, and this, this genome sequence which is quite early in microbial genomics. And, and this led to uh, John Reeve connecting with the Bird Polar Center, uh, Ellen and Lonnie Thompson, who had actually been accruing ice cores from around the world. There's something like 8,000 there now. It's quite an impressive center. And they pulled out ancient microbes. So this is the work of Brent Christner when he was, I believe, a PhD student. And, and they pulled out ancient microbes to be able to get ancient microbes out of ice. And so that's now a new source. Uh, we're doing work these days to try to pull out with the modern toolkit microbes from ice as a, as a way to look back in time. Another community's inspired effort was to think, well, what other amino acids could be out there? And this led Joe Kritsky, who was really thinking about uh, chemistry and physiology and, and put those pieces together to discover the 21st amino acid, uh, pyrolysin. So, these microbial communities thoughts kept going and, and in the medical realm, a, a lot of researchers started meeting as a biofilms interest group. They now have training grants and, and cystic fibrosis research funding. Another group across campus over in the Ag College was interested in microbial based solutions for agriculture and they're working on center level efforts. And um, in 2014 as a discovery theme and then 2017 as an, an institute, 
the infectious disease related folks got together to form an, an interdisciplinary institute. And I'll talk a little more about IDI in a moment. So in 2017, it became one of only a few centers or institutes at Ohio State, uh, formal, uh, fully supported big centers. We have uh, world ready viromics workshops where about 50 trainees were brought in to, to learn viromics through these years uh, from around the world. It's something like 25 countries served and, and over 200 trainees at this point. And uh, in 2020, we had a center of microbiome science that was formed and uh, an NSF funded Emerge Biology Integration Institute. And you're going to hear a little bit more about IDI, what the center is doing, and what the Emerge Biology Integration Institute is in a moment. And I'm gonna pause here just to emphasize in the background of all this was incredible work from Bob Tabita, um, uh, an Ohio eminent scholar at this point. And uh, he had in his early days, uh, those dates off to the left made a lot of discoveries about Rubisco through the course that, that he led a lot of the development of and, and the funding efforts of along with John Reeve and others, um, started to think about community context in 2001, 2004, started publishing some nice work in the Rubisco space that brought in how ecosystem context matters. And the dots between 2004 and 2020 are just to say, this is actually a, quite a time when he spent really supporting early career researchers and building up centers and um, genomic capacity uh, for Ohio State. So, you know, kind of giving back and helping build a foundation for microbial communities research that he was very supportive of, faculty that came in for. And even in 2020, he had a science paper with, with Kelly Wrighton's lab and uh, Justin North leading it from his lab, where they explored new aspects of biochemistry in the context of microbial communities. And unfortunately, we lost Bob earlier this year in, in January of 2021, but he was a real force here in the backdrop of the growth of microbiome science at Ohio State. So Ohio State's pretty big. And so not surprising, there's a lot of different people who study different elements of the microbiome. We've talked some about soils and plant pathogens. We've talked some about the oceans. There's also uh, Zaki Sabri's work who studies uh, cockroach guts and microbiomes in there to understand how symbionts and um, evolution, microevolution happens. He's also interested in this cockroach gut and this microbiome responses as a way to model disease. Uh, and so he's got some beautiful work in that front. Um, Karen Dana Miller of an engineering is interested in indoor microbiome and how uh, in particular that can relate to asthma and other issues. She's also studied the microbiome on space, in space on the International Space Station. So, so those are some exciting environments. There's also a lot of exciting host microbe interactions happening. Uh, people studying hydrothermal vent microbiology, coral reef microbiology, uh, a lot of different uh, animal associated, human, mouse, and animals. Uh, over in the vet med school, as well as in College of Medicine. And in engineering, uh, Natalie Hall is, is leading a, a, a drinking water effort to try to bring drinking water microbiomes up. And uh, I mentioned some of the ice work that uh, Lonnie and Ellen Thompson have been doing to study ancient microbiomes in ice. So beyond that history, there's some rich interdisciplinary support. And, and I'm going to highlight for a few minutes each of these three venues, the, the Infectious Disease Institute, the Center of Microbiome Science, and the Emerge Biology Integration Institute. The Infectious Disease Institute has six programmatic themes, and one of them you'll see is microbial communities. And the goal of the Infectious Disease Institute is really to get these six themes, which normally are pretty isolated, talking to each other. And they do a great job through, um, at least pre-COVID, we had monthly mixers uh, and, and other uh, co-sponsored seminars and uh, a joint annual meeting. We do a great job of trying to bring scientists from the six themes who don't normally get a talk together, together. And that means interfacing interdisciplinary kind of science. There's 260 faculty now as part of IDI across 13 colleges. So it's an impressive Institute. And there's a lot of things I could have said about IDI. I'm just going to focus on, on one slide of something that's near and dear to all of us. This is SARS CoV 2 here in the middle. And, and IDI really mediated a response, an interdisciplinary response at Ohio State, which I think is really admirable. And um, the, the way it started, of course, was you, you do need to think about testing. And so immediately they got testing up and going. It was actually external 
using a company early on. And then over time, uh, you'll see, and you'll hear a little bit more about this later. We've got our own testing center now at Ohio State. Actually, Ohio State's testing center has, um, it's saving quite a bit of money for the university, uh, has a lot of great workflows and, and uh, processes in place, has something like 70 people working at it, uh, and has hundreds of thousands of tests now under its belt. And it's been doing more testing, in fact, than 10 of the United 10 states in the US. Uh, so it's quite an impressive effort. It's, it's a significant chunk of Ohio's testing just happening here at Ohio State. And so that's not too surprising. You'd expect testing to be part of a response, but there was also an interest in, what about this virus particle on, on surfaces and in other reservoirs? And so part of that group led to uh, another group of scientists developing eScout, which brings together wastewater monitoring and looking at other environmental reservoirs like animals to look for uh, COVID positive samples. And they also, uh, there's been work uh, by this. So the eScout work is from Jiyong Li and Vanessa Hale and, um, <clears throat> and several others, I'm sure I'm forgetting in the spot here. And then this work here, I'm uh, just bringing up was focused in the New York Times. This is work from Jeff Jonas, uh, Jesse Quick and Linda Safe. And they were asked by Ford if the police cars were gonna have people coming in and out of them, they wanna know, because some said of those people will be COVID positive, whether uh, the car is safe afterwards. And if it's not, how can they decontaminate it? And so they worked out <clears throat> just using some fundamental virology uh, temperatures. It turns out if you heat the car up quite a bit, you can actually decontaminate the car quite significantly. So, so there's a disinfectant process that now Ford uses that was developed by scientists here at Ohio State. Similarly, in a very applied manner, I mentioned Karen Benamilla's space and, and indoor work earlier. She's been interested in the question, <clears throat> on surfaces in, in your house, uh, where does COVID hang out? And so it turns out she's done quite a bit of work carefully understanding how to sample from dust. And, and uh, it turns out dust collects quite a lot of these viral particles. And so you can use a passive sampler to collect dust. And that could be a nice concentrated way to tell whether a household has COVID problematically. So she's working on using that for indoor surveillance methods moving forward. And of course, there's a, there's a, a huge medical school here on campus and, and they're interested in the disease context. And, and here, um, this is in combining serology and, and trying to understand the virology and trying to combine that with um, clinical outcomes, epidemiology, and actually communication. How do you communicate the findings from these fundamental scientific efforts to the public? And so this center was funded by um, uh, recently by federal agencies, and it's the Center to Stop COVID. And they've built out a really impressive network of sampling, focusing on first responders and their um, contacts in their household context and trying to understand um, uh, uh, tracing and, and the biology of the, of the disease. All this is also happening. Again, IDI playing variable roles in all this, uh, trying to bring everything together through modeling. And there's teams of modelers that try to um, look at these different kinds of data being generated in the different flavors of, of science here and bring that together through modeling. So, so the IDI was built to help us understand infectious disease. And we got a trial right out of the gate with COVID and all things COVID. And, and I think that it's really responded impressively um, to come out and help with each of these separate programs to be connected and to um, allow communication across them and allow there to be leveraging across these different programs. Now, if we move on from the Infectious Disease Institute, I, I wanna tell you for a few minutes about the Center of Microbiome Science, which uh, is founded basically to try to really empower microbiome science on campus uh, for the design and prediction of understanding microbial communities wherever they are, animal, plant, human, environmental, and engineered systems. And there's been uh, uh, meetings of this group for over five years. So since 2015, this group, a lot of these, there's 22 groomed to 22 faculty have been meeting for what we call the Environmental Microbiology Seminar Series. And, and then we decided to formalize that effort as a center and, and reach out more broadly. And now there's 76 faculty across nine colleges 
and there's 74 trainees as members. It's an open membership call. And we really try to empower microbiome science on campus through the four C's here, compute, curriculum, capabilities, and community. So I'll go through each of these at a very high level. With compute, we're simply getting the tools needed to the right place. So over 70 apps that cover quality control processing and analysis of microbial and viral data, thoroughly documented at, at this particular place. And, and on the Ohio supercomputer for any researcher from the state of Ohio, not just Ohio State, as well as these community cyber infrastructures I mentioned a couple of times, cybers and Kbase. We're pretty well advanced at cybers and we're, we're starting to try to do some work at Kbase to complement efforts there. And the driver here in this effort is really Dr. Ben Boldick, who has painstakingly put together these apps and these capabilities, the documentation. Uh, we work together on a user says, oh, I want a new tool. We decide whether it could be generally usable. We try to put it together for them. Uh, and we've got a proposal process for that. And then putting together guides at all levels for someone who might need an intro to Chime 2 or to just how to use Unix and Linux pops or how to use the Ohio supercomputer and also for developers to bring in their own apps. And so, so this is a really just a, a yeoman's task from, from Ben. On the curriculum front, we actually have established a four course microbiome informatics training track at Ohio State. And this is uh, depending on where you'd like to enter. So early graduate student or undergraduate who are new to the microbiome science field might wanna conceptually uh, get into the field with something like environmental microbiology first course listed. Maybe they haven't done a lot of informatics. They haven't done alignments, don't know phylogeny, don't know about the common databases. They would take the first level bioinformatics and molecular microbiology course. And then for the more advanced students, they can get very conceptually deep in a topics in microbiome science class. This is basically a three hour deep discussion on one, maybe two papers where you really get the background of the microbiome science paper you're reading. And then the last one is the course that we're actually trying to make uh, digital form here. So our microbiome informatics course that I mentioned I've taught since 2015, a hands-on course we're trying to essentially digitize here. There's also a ton of other courses at Ohio State related to microbiome, and we've collected those as we, as we learn about them at the Center of Microbiome Science website. And on the backdrop of this formalized curriculum, the Center has also aggregated uh, leading trainees in, in disciplines in this space to try to lead working groups, practical working groups that meet monthly uh, for microbiome, virum, and ecological statistics. And I've, I've highlighted just two of those trainees because they're actually both going to be instructors uh, in the course in the seminar series here. On the capabilities front, we, we survey our members to try to identify what are the key things we need, what would be differentiators in our research. And so one of them we've identified is trying to get metagenomic sequencing costs down through scalable approaches. And so we're trying to get to, this is our goal, uh, our sort of two, three year goal to get to a $7 metagenome. And <clears throat> we realize that not everybody wants to handle their own analytics. Not everybody wants to be trying to pioneer in this new space. Um, there's great videos on YouTube of the bioinformatic pipeline, which of course breaks all over the place, the leaky pipeline. So, not everybody wants to put up with that. So we're thinking of creating an analytical service as well. This is an effort to try to um, uh, create a, a fee-for-service option for, uh, for, for members. We've identified and realized that there's a lot of great microbiome scientists out there in the world, and they are figuring out what microbes cause dysbiosis and, and what help something be healthy in different environmental and host-associated contexts. And so the next question for the field, and many are, are trying to address this already, um, is to try to figure out how you get to a place where you can design or move that dysbiotic community back to a healthy one. And we've been working because of our oceans work on, on ecological scale uh, capture and characterization methods for a long time. And so we're putting efforts into trying to make that a differentiating capability in the center. And then I mentioned that the COVID testing center, and this is just a, a shout out to Jeff Jonas from uh, OSU Micro and from, from Seth Faith, who's uh, a center microbiome science co-director. Um, and Seth and Jeff have just led an amazing effort to 
go from zero to literally 70 people to try to do that large scale testing that we talked about earlier. For building community, we're trying to really develop a local community. And this is more focused for folks at Ohio State or maybe anyone who wants to do something similar at your own university. For us, it started with a website and that website has information about the people involved, the faculty. Uh, we also have resources that, like, where do we get our sequencing done? What are the costs? We have um, curriculum, like I said, all those courses that are related to microbiome science. So students can easily find different courses. We've also added a new link for consultations. So we're learning that people, maybe, maybe a clinician doesn't know how to even start with the research, but wants to write a microbiome aim into an R01. We're happy to consult with them for half an hour, sort of figure out what the right way is to serve them and then grow that out from there. So we've started this new consultations capability. There's a forum on the, on the comms website for that. We try to keep membership even in COVID times, aware of what's happening through a monthly email, which includes emailing about events, training and curricula. And we also try to highlight early career researchers and people who have done something or won an award or something exciting with scientist spotlights. Pre-COVID, we had monthly faculty mixers, which were great for getting together and talking across disciplines and making connections. We'll definitely pick those up uh, once we move into the light at the end of the tunnel space. And uh, we don't yet have our own seminar series. We've decided to send Center of Microbiome Science researchers who are interested in seminars to the IDI uh, Microbial Communities Work in Progress series. And so that's been great um, interaction with, with IDI. On a more regional level, we're interested in, in working with uh, the Midwest microbiome uh, researchers who've had started the symposium. And there's an idea of maybe holding it at Ohio State in 2023. And uh, we've been continuing our OSU Viromics workshops. The next one is scheduled for October, 2021. It may get delayed yet again. It's been delayed since last October, but we will just see how, how the landscape looks. And on a global level, we're trying to connect to um, uh, many researchers. The, the Emerge Biology Integration Institute is, is actually um, like a dozen research in a dozen institutions around the world, and the field site is actually in Sweden. Tara Oceans, I mentioned that large consortium. That's um, dozens of PIs focused in the European Union, but we're also working with them uh, to bring our science to that uh, exciting study. And the Microbiome Centers Consortium that's trying to aggregate centers around the world so that we can all share training opportunities, webinar series opportunities, et cetera. So the last of these three interdisciplinary entities I wanted to just share some information about is this recent NSF funded Emerge Biology Integration Institute. It's directed by Virginia Rich at Ohio State and Ruth Varner at University of New Hampshire. And the goal is to focus on this field site in Northern Sweden. It's a long-term ecological research site, um, not by NSF standards, but it's been studied as a long-term site for quite a while and is where permafrost is thawing and it's got many stages of permafrost thaw. And so the idea is if you study that comprehensively, can we hope to predict how the microbes in the permafrost when they wake up as thaw occurs, how they, who of course modulate carbon one, single carbon metabolisms, including carbon dioxide to methane transitions and, and the opposite, how will they impact climate change? So, so this is an incredibly interdisciplinary. These are all these disciplines intensively involved, all studying the same site to this biology integration institute and a, and a testament to NSF for, for putting out there um, the idea that biology has to integrate across a lot of disciplines. And before that, um, uh, uh, this kind of work is also funded in, in through DOE's um, systems biology and genomic sciences kinds of programs, but in very different ways and very different systems. So what is it that Emerge hopes to do? Uh, this is what we call the G2E2G or genes to ecosystems to genes framework. And so I'm showing here right now the genes to ecosystems or G2E, the front end part of that. And that it starts in the green there with the central dog. DNA goes to RNA, makes protein. And that molecular biologically studied intracellular set of uh, circumstances are what control the fate of the cell uh, to a degree. And then the recognition is that that cell 
interacts with other cells within its population, the other green cells there, and um, with its environment, the chemistry coming in and out from those blue dotted arrows. Uh, and then it's also part of a community of other cells, the non-green cells there, and its predators, the viruses pictured there. And then not just the microbial community, but grow it out a step further, and you get the involvement of not only more chemistry now from plants, but also the plants themselves as a different ecosystem from soil in this case. And that ecosystem has system outputs. And so you can study the molecular biology, the cells, the ecology and evolution of all those interactions and the ecosystem science part of the system outputs. And, and that becomes the genes to ecosystems part. And that, that really was what the refunded for 10 years into the isogeny consortium framework. And what we're trying to do now is recognize that the ecosystem actually feeds back on that same GTE framework. And so this is the ecosystem to genes part. And you can see we've, we've captured it or crystallized it with what we call the three A's. In response to ecosystem change, cells will adapt, change the way that communities assemble, and at a very short term, acclimate. And so those three arguably sort of molecular biology studies in the acclimation level, uh, evolutionary biology studies with respect to adaptation and ecology studies with respect to assembly are kind of different time scales. And so we're trying to interested that can we capture the, the full ecology, evolution, and molecular biological responses of cells in an ecosystem context. And then do that under the changing system outputs that we see and measure. And distill all that down, the G3-2G measurements, through models. And one's a trait-based model called BioCrunch, which derives from the genomics information. And the other is a landscape-based model called uh, Ecosys, which will have a, a variant for the C2G2T framework. So that's the idea of the Emerged Biology Integration Institute. And, and each of those pieces themselves are pretty cutting edge individually and, and throw them all together here, focused on a single site and a single problem to understand how microbiology and soils can impact climate change. And that's, that's a really exciting new initiative just launched last year in September. So this is my last slide. Uh, I hope you've, you've learned about, you came to us already excited about microbiome science, so you knew why. I hope you're thinking now, oh, but viruses are cool too. Uh, I also hope you've got a little bit of a picture of what the webinar series will be like. Moving forward, all the other Tuesday sessions will be by domain experts who will take you through the hands-on steps of each of the processing steps to get from raw sequence data through to biological storage. In addition, at Ohio State, there's this history of of, of growing microbiology and RNA biology and then microbiome science. And that's led to um, really embracing interdisciplinary uh, science through support structures like an Infectious Disease Institute, an Emerge Biology Integration Institute, and a Center of Microbiome Science. I'd like to just thank uh, the NSF for their funding for the Emerge Biology Integration Institute, the Moore Foundation for their support directly for this webinar series, and uh, Ohio State, both the Office of Research and offices of, or, and the Colleges of Engineering and Arts and Sciences that have supported the Center of Microbiome Science. Thank you for your time. And if I could have help from Katie about how we switch to, if there's any talks that the um, panelists think or sorry, any questions that the panelists think should be brought up? Let me know. Happy to answer questions.
do any of the panelists know of any uh, questions? Hey, hey, Matt. Um, just a few people have asked about uh, the, the hands-on lectures and the software and data, et cetera, necessary if people want to follow along at home. Um, so uh, Olivier is going to um, add a page. We, we've answered this, this in the Q&A, but just for everyone, um, Olivier is going to add a page to the uh, current webinar site um, listing week by week uh, anything that um, people need. Super. Thanks, Sheree. All right, Olivier, Jerong, Ahmed, Ben, did you have any questions you saw that are critical or? And for the attendees, if you're trying to ask a question, I believe you just um, put it in the chat or the q and I think we're monitoring both. I see a question from Hanny uh, about sample preparation for viromics. We we tend to cover that in our viromics workshop, but which is a full two and a half days. But in in the two two hour windows, we're not intending to cover that. There's a lot of um, literature now, I think, out there in that space. But does anyone see any other questions that might be? There's also a question about whether plans for the other courses I mentioned to make them available remotely online. Uh, I know that um, I, I think all of those are working towards some sort of online effort. And I'm not sure at what rate that's happening, but I know that they're concerned about when to, when to have their next in-person workshop. And so they are thinking about online. And I'll say Marin with Ambio has already done online work, and I'm sure Greg with, with Chime 2 has already done online resources. In fact, I think that uh, I think Sharif's going to cover Chime 2 online resources, uh, touch base on those briefly in his, his weeks. Great. Well, I think we've given enough time for questions. Uh, oh, I see one about how do you subscribe for those courses to uh, the courses that I just mentioned. I'm not sure how you subscribe to them, but I'm sure if you go to, you know, a Chime 2 website and the Anvio website and a, um, IMGM and KBase and Cybers, I'm sure you can see that there'll be some information about, about those. Someone's asking, do the sessions build on each other? If we miss a week, will we be behind? Um, you can always, uh, they'll be recorded, so you can always go back and catch them. Uh, and yes, to a degree, many of them build on each other, but uh, it's sort of like baking a cake. We have all the different pieces in place. And so you can slot in and have a useful time and just fill in the part you missed at a different time. We are recording each of the webinars and um, including capturing the Q and A as best we can. And we're gonna try not to interrupt the webinar presenter because there's gonna be a team like there was today fielding the Q and A and trying to answer those in real time so that the, um, 
so we don't get too off off schedule because we do want to try to keep these constrained to an hour and a half to two hours each session. Uh, Matt, we have a question in the chat as well. Do you think doing some work on different species of non-human primates will be a feasible idea? Um, oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, sort of the beauty of where we're all at is, is there's a lot of microbiomes to explore, and I think if there's an important reason to suspect that the microbiota may impact, um, you know, the non-human primates, it's likely they do, then, then that could be a good study system. Uh, this, someone's asking whether someone not at OSU can attend the courses. Um, the only courses that are online right now is this effort. So the hands-on microbiome informatics effort. We have not thought about the three other courses that are part of our microbiome informatics training track, making those digital. I would say that the uh, environmental genomics, environmental microbiology course is unique enough that it might warrant it, but its current structure is, um, is definitely classroom oriented. So that would be quite a shift for that professor. Um, I would say the, the bioinformatics one, that, you know, that's pretty generalizable. There's a lot of online tools available for that one. And then uh, the topics in microbiome science is, a, is a currently very classroom oriented. I don't see us doing that online anytime soon. But we're trying to make this one available. <laughs> I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to everyone who is attending. We have 